Um, it's really a privilege to be here among such, such experts. Um, the title of my talk is Mad Peacock Devotees and the Cloud-like Buddha, the Interweaving of Poetics and Devotion in the Subodha Lankara. So hopefully this will bring together some of the discussions we've been having about this court religion dichotomy, which tends to pervade discussion of um, at least religion and art. Um, I'll begin my talk with a verse um, from the Subodha Lankara. So, Romancha Pincha Rachana, Sadhu Vada Hita Taddani, Lalantime Muni Megu, Mada Sadhu Sikavala, which I translate as the peacock like devotees fanning the feathers of their wings and crying in appreciation, frolic in frenzied madness at the sight of the cloud like sage. This verse in Sangharakata's lucid poetics or Subodha Lankara encapsulates the unique quality of late medieval Pali Kavya. The verse tinkles with delicate Sukumalata sounds embellished with a variety of ornaments of meaning. It cleverly exploits the Sanskritic trope of excited peacocks awaiting the rains as a metaphor for the enthrallment felt by Buddhist devotees at the sight of their master. Those unfamiliar with late medieval Sri Lankan Buddhism may be struck by the seemingly paradoxical celebration of passionate devotion to an ascetic who spent much of his life teaching the value of dispassion. Daniel Ingalls certainly viewed Buddhism and Sanskrit court poetry as <coughs> incompatible in this regard, stating in his translation of the Subhashita Ratnakosha that Buddhist monks could succeed in the court tradition only by forgetting that they were Buddhists. If we were to take into account only the Sri Lankan literature of the first millennium, one would have to agree with Ingalls that there was a certain ambivalence, if not antipathy, um, towards Kavya in Buddhist monastic life. As we have just heard, uh, the works of Ratna Sri on the Kavya Dasha at the end of the first millennium radically changed this state of affairs in Sri Lanka. It was Sangharakita, though, our Aristotle in this story, who repositioned Pali Kavya as a legitimate means of Buddhist practice. Writing in the 13th century, Sangharakta, who was the Sangha's grand master, the Mahasami, and himself of royal descent, interweaved ideas from many works on Sanskrit poetics, in particular the Kavya Dasha, to provide a theoretical framework for the composition of Pali devotional poetry. In this paper, I argue that Sangharakita's central path of devotion as delineated in his lucid poetics, demonstrates that Buddhism and the court tradition could and did coalesce. As D.D. Kosambi claimed in opposition to Ingalls, poet and priest were brothers in fact and deed. Sex and religion went together. Sangharakita wrote at a time when both Pali and Singhala were increasingly indebted to Sanskrit literary forms. His teacher was the famed Sari Putta, who wrote, among many other works, a Sanskrit commentary on Ratna Sri's Chandra Panchika, which I'm grateful to Dragomir Dimitrov for publishing recently. He worked as head of the Sangha during the reign of Vijayabahu III, who reigned from 1232 to 1236, and was the mentor of Parakrambahu II, who reigned from 1236 to 1270, Parak when he was young, when Parakrama II was young. And Parakrambahu II was a king who was famously coronated as the scholar who knows all the literature of the Kali age, Kali Kala Sahitya Sabanyu Pandita. Sangharakita equally deserved this title, if not more so, as he displays in his works a magisterial command of Sanskrit Shastra and literature. As an author, his most significant scholarly contributions were in the field of Pali philology, notably works on grammar, poetics, and metrics. His greatest work was the Lucid Poetics, to which he wrote a commentary known as the Commentary of the Grand Master, the Mahasami Tika. Petra Kiefer Pulse has refuted Clifford Wright's suggestion that different authors composed the Karakas and commentary on the basis that in his other works, Sangharakata cites both as his own compositions. So pretty conclusive. On the one hand, the lucid poetics speaks to a world of cosmopolitan pundits uh, adapting and adopting the, the latest ideas in Sanskrit literary theory from places as far away as Kashmir. 
while on the other, its Buddhist devotional content addresses more local developments in Sinhala literary, uh, Sing Sinhala literary culture in particular. Charles Hallisey was one of the first to theorize about a wave of devotional works composed in Sinhala from the 12th century onwards, such as the Puja Valiya, Bhut Sarana, Amavattara. It is perhaps no coincidence that Sangharakita's lucid poetics is filled with similar devotional sentiment and that the other Pali Kavyas of this period, such as the Pajamadu, Jinnacharita, and Jinnalankara, are imbued with the same purpose. After each figure, um, Sangharakita, a poetic figure, Sangharakita wastes no opportunity to furnish his work with an illustration in praise of the Buddha. So pretty much every single example in his work is um, a praise of the Buddha. He demonstrates one aspect of the poetic merit of ojas, or strength, for instance, with the following verse. So I translate. Even though I am dead, may my skull not turn to dust, as by merit it rests on the Buddha's lotus feet. I can come to uh, explain why this is a type of ojas. It may be unfamiliar to why that would be ojas, but we can maybe talk about it later. For the most part, the devotional content of his examples does not influence the cosmopolitan framework of his treatise. Like the Kavyadasha and numerous other works on Sanskrit poetics, Sangharakita uses the image of the female lover as a metaphor for the arrangement of topics in the work and their interrelationship. His lucid poetics consists of five chapters, namely poetic faults, dosa, the removal of faults, dosa parihara, poetic merits, gunna, ornaments, that is figures of sense, alankara, and aesthetic moods and feelings, rasabhava. This order deviates markedly from the Kavyadasha and closely resembles the chapter divi divisions of Vamana's Kavya Lankara. Sangharakta begins with poetic faults and their removal on the basis that, like a good wife, whatever is faultless is implicitly virtuous. When treating the merits as independent properties in chapter 3, he uniquely, as far as I'm aware, and I may be wrong, um, defines them as being nothing more than ornaments of sound, Shabda Alankara. His Alankara chapter proper consists only of figures of sense, Arta Alankara. The Alankaras are dealt with after the Gunas, as he states that it is through ornamentation that a good lover becomes exceptionally attractive. We've seen a similar metaphor th many times. Aesthetic moods and feelings are treated last, since they necessarily occur as a result of the proper execution of the preceding chapter. So it's a very logical order. The lucid poetics is understandably most often discussed in, rela in relation to Dundin's Kavya Dasha. Sangharakita cites Dundin as a source for his chapter on Arta Alankaras, and it is there that the Kavya Dasha's influence is most pronounced. His opening two chapters on faults and their removal bear greater similarity, at least in terms of their subdivisions, with Vamana's Kavya Lankara. Like Vamana, Sangharakita divides his analysis of faults into the faults of words, the faults of sentences, and the faults of the meaning of sentences. He follows the, most, the more expansive treatment of faults in both Vamaha and Vamana, and discusses 23 faults in comparison to the reduced 10 discussed by Dundin. Yet where Dundin, Vamaha, and Vamana agree, such as on the fault of tautology, a karta, Sangharakita still prefers to adopt the wording of Dundin's definitions. In general, Sangharakita places his faults in the same categories as Vamana and adopts some of his innovations, such as the introduction of the generalized fault of gramya or coarse language. The use of Buddhist devotional verses to illustrate these faults, however, allows Sangharakita to imbue um, the chapter with an air of sacrilegious humor. So you can imagine, if you're, every verse has to be about the Buddha, the chapter on doses becomes a bit problematic, because essentially <laughs> you have to write faulty poetry um, to the Buddha. Um, for the fault of ambigu ambiguity, so Sangsaya, for instance, he pens the following verse in which the poet inadvertently calls the Buddha a cow when trying to praise the glory of his halo. So the verse, Munin, uh, Muninda Chandima Loka Rasa Lo Lavilochano, uh, so, if we translate it as the poet would like us to translate it, it would be as follows. Only the people who have entered the path 
are overjoyed when they see his rays, his rangsi, go. Their eyes rolling with emotion at the brilliance of the moon like Buddha. However, clearly, go does not just mean rays, it also means cow. So the, 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 the fault here would be that you could, you could translate it as only the people who have entered the path are overjoyed when they see the cow. Um, Sangharakta's chapter on poetic merits posits the same ten gunas as both Dundin and Vamana, and he mediates between the two in his treatment of the topic. He capitalizes on the ambiguous relationship between guna and alankara in Dundin, and defines the gunas as identical to ornaments of sound, as I've just mentioned. This allows him to admit a Shabda Alankara section from the Lucid Poetics entirely. His definitions of the Ten Merits are largely Pali reworkings of Dundin's own. Dundin's characterization of the merit, known as the Tenda, Sukumara, in Pali Sukumarata, is transformed in Pali as follows. Um, sorry, I'll translate the Pali. Um, that which has many non-rough sounds is free from all weak sounds, and has sounds that are not difficult to pronounce is the merit called the soft, Sukuma Lata. So you can see it is a, it is a, uh, a modification, there's some modifications, but generally speaking, this, this can be considered uh, a type of translation of Dundin's Kavyadasha. Now, despite claiming that poetic merits only, re only relate to the sounds of poetry, Sangharakita also borrows from Vamana, who divided poetic merits into both merits of sense, artagunna, and merits of sound, shabdagunna. He relies on Vamana in his discussions on both the phonetic and semantic aspects of ojas, strength, sukuma lata, the tender, and atavyakta, artavyakta, the explicit. Sangharakita adopts, for instance, Vamana's idea that there can be tenderness in sense as well as sound, and uses the same example given by Vamana, that instead of stating directly that someone has died, matta, one should instead say that only their fame remains, kittisesa. So that would be poetically um, polite. As Sangharakita moves from faults to merits and then in turn to ornaments, steadily beautifying the body of poetry, the Buddha, as his muse, is also transformed into an object of devotion and desire. Illustrating the merit of samadhi or superimposition, for instance, Sangharakta composes the following erotic verse. Ugirantova sasnehara sam jinavaro jane, vasanto maduram damam kamna sampinaye janam. Which I translate as, Who would not be pleased by the excellent jinna teaching his sweet dhamma, as if pouring out his yearnings of love upon the people? This interweaving of courtly literary theory and Buddhist devotional verses continues in his fourth chapter on ornaments of sense. Heirambha Chattaji, in his book Pali and Sanskrit Alankaras, surveyed the 37 Alankaras in this chapter and showed that most are adopted from Dundon's mirror. I'm happy to provide everyone with a PDF of that book. It's incredibly hard to get, so if you would like it. Um, the close connection between the lucid poetics and the mirror here affords a clearer glimpse at Sangharakita's reliance on Ratnashree's Tika, as we have just um, heard from Dragomir. Um, as Dragomir Dimitrov has noted, a, a comparison between the Grand Master Commentary and Ratnashree's Tika reveals that Sangharakita was undoubtedly reading Ratnashree whenever he utilized the mirror. Compare, for example, Sangharakita's and Ratnashree's commentaries on the ornament of Krama or Yatasankhya sequential order. I'm not going to translate it, but I'll leave it there and you can see. I picked this in particular because this is pretty much one of the only verses which is um, uh, almost untouched by, by, by Sangharakata. It's, it's, it's pretty much a, a direct translation and therefore I assumed that the comment it would be the best place to find the relationship with the Ratna Shri and I was right that when you look at it you can see it's almost um, identical in fact. The fluid relationship between Dundin's erotic court poetry and Sangharakita's devotional verses is no more apparent than in Sangharakita's appropriation of Dundin's examples for various figures in this chapter. On occasion, he takes one of Dundin's ambiguously amorous verses and with some um, 
minor changes, such as a well-placed vocative, O Jinnah, for instance, turns it into a poem of devotion and piety. Take, for example, his minor amendment to Dundin's definition and illustration of prohibitive similes. I, I, that was, I don't know if that's the right translation for Padishir Dopama, maybe not. Um, so we can see here, we have essentially a, a direct translation of the definition of the Alankara and also a translation of the example, yet he just puts in, skillfully I might add, he puts in a Jinnah, just to be on the safe side. So to translate, to translate it, the frigid mottled moon is incapable of rivaling your face, O Jinnah. This is a prohibitive simile. Sangharakta never explicitly discusses the type of religiosity he imagines such verses to inculcate, nor does he openly reflect on the purpose of devotional poetry. Yet it would be wrong to think that Sangharakta was oblivious to the implications of fusing Buddhist devotion and courtly art. In his final chapter, he introduces a standard framework of aesthetic moods and feelings, Rasabhava, which he borrows from Anandavadana's Dvanyaloka, a work he quotes at the beginning of the Lucid Poetics. Like the Dvanyaloka, the Lucid Poetics posits nine rasas, culminating in Santarasa, Shantarasa, or the mood of quiescence. Unlike others, such as the Bengali Vaishnavas who sought liberation through aesthetic experience, Sangharakta does not relate any particular rasa with nirvana or as the feeling, uh, sorry, or as the means to nirvana. His santa rasa takes samma, shramma, or peace as its foundational feeling, tai bhava, and friendship, metta, compassion, daya, and joy, moda, as its stimulants, vibhava. Sangharakta never links Santarasa with liberation, nor does he speak of it as the spiritual goal of his devotional poetry. In fact, in his opening discussion in chapter 5, he speaks of rasa as a subject or goal that is, I quote, not studied by those of high faith, whose minds are gladly focused on analyzing the, tr the tradition of the pure, true Dhamma, which is the soul rasa, the rasa of liberation, and the only cause for escaping the suffering of samsara entirely. The goal for Sangharakta then, in composing his devotional poetry, is not to evoke a salvific aesthetic experience. It is only the Dhamma that can produce the taste of liberation, what we might call Theravada Buddhism's tenth, tenth rasa. The nascent harmony between court and monastery that develops throughout the lucid poetics is brought then to an abrupt halt in Sangharakta's treatment of rasa. The literature of Buddha Vachana or the Dhamma remains the only literature that can provide an otherworldly experience of liberation. The question remains, however, as to why Sangharakta went to such lengths to establish Buddhist devotional poetry if he considered aesthetic experience as somehow subordinate. Why did he not simply continue to espouse the orthodox position of former commentators like Buddha Gosa, who famously referred to stories such as the Mahabharata and Ramayana as senseless babble, Sampa Palapa? The reason is of course multifaceted, but I wish to speculate here on the possibility that developments in Sanskrit literary theory at least contributed to the tradition's change of heart about the value of artistic expression. A close reading of the lucid poetics reveals that Sangharakata found a way to reconcile aesthetic emotion with Buddhist ideals by consciously centering his literary theory around the principle of propriety or ochitya in Sanskrit, auchitya. He begins his chapter on rasa with a verse stating that this chapter has been composed by a poet possessed of creative eloquence, Patibana, who relies on worldly discourse, Lokavahara, and who feels the exhilaration of utter propriety. He declares that Ochitya is the greatest secret among poets, and that only the one who understands propriety in worldly affairs is worthy of praise. 
Here, Sangharakita echoes Anandavadana's famous pronouncement in his Dvanya Loka that a composition containing well-known propriety is the utmost secret of rasa. The idea that propriety, auchitya, was the essence of the aesthetic experience was first articulated in the Dvanya Loka, but was developed by other later Kashmiri literary theorists. Kshemendra, in particular, wrote a treatise on the topic called the Auchitya Vichara Cha Cha, and defined Auchitya as the state of being truly suited to a certain thing, Sadrisham Kila Yasyayat. Kshemendra uses similes in each verse of his work to connect poetic propriety with worldly propriety. The implication is that poetry must be aligned with the social norms and proper behaviors of Brahmanical monarchical society for it to evoke aesthetic emotions. If the poetic text does not properly relate to the social context of its audience, then it will fail to produce rasa. This instantiation of the world outside the text as the determining feature of literary suggestion is what Sheldon Pollock has aptly termed Sanskrit's social aesthetic. In the hands of the Kashmiri literary theorists, skill becomes an index of one's, um, literary skill becomes an index of one's social and by extension moral character. To write good poetry is to know what it is to be a good person. This is what Sangharakta means when he declares that only the one who understands propriety in worldly f- affairs is worthy of praise. It implies an acceptance on the part of Sangharakita of the authority of Sanskrit court culture's social and moral rules, worldly affairs. This socio-moral aspect associated with the composition and appreciation of Sanskrit poetry is also found in the work of Ratnashri. When commenting on Dundin's jocular pun at the beginning of the mirror, um, that, we're all, that we're all familiar with. He says that an incorrectly used word, go, reveals a speaker's own bovine nature, gotva. I'm sure I've done that in this talk, probably. Um, Ratnashri comments with unwavering sincerity, unlike, unlike the humor of his master, what Ratnashri is pretty austere. Ratnashri comments with unwavering sincerity that one who is ignorant of literary theory lapses into nonsense and as such is declared by the wise to be a beast in human form. He also adds that one who knows the Shastras is worshipped as a god by those attracted to good qualities, though the other, i.e. the one who does not know the Shastras, is regarded as a beast. Sangharakta too, at the beginning of Lucid Poetics, mirrors the sentiment of Ratnashri's commentary and states more than once that those who cannot distinguish between merits and faults, uh, the merits and faults of poetry, are no more than human beasts, (laughs) purisapasu. He even quotes a verse of the Buddha to support the view that one must associate only with the cultivated and not with the bestial in erudite. So we're in good company today. Um, the importance of propriety in Sangharakta's lucid poetics is made further explicit in his first chapter, where he introduces a lack of propriety, ochityahina, as a poetic fault. When discussing the removal of the fault, he declares that Aesthetic emotion develops only when propriety is fostered. (coughs) Sangharakta presents the following two verses as examples of impropriety. So the first one, I translate as, I alone in the world am most worthy of ceaseless worship, since it is only within me that all virtues are found. The second verse of impropriety is as follows. If asked, how could I not give up even my life? Even so, my heart trembles to give up my son. Sangharakta remarks that the first verse is improper, (coughs) since it is vulgar for a good person to praise themselves. Fine. He then situates the second verse in the context of the Visantara Jataka narrative and states that the impropriety here lies in Visantara's expression of intrepidation in giving away his son. This, he argues, transgresses the merit of loftiness, Within the framework of propriety, the aesthetic charm of the merit of loftiness clearly becomes an ethical value. Sangharakta then furnishes this discussion with the following verse, of course praising the Buddha's enlightenment, as an example of the removal of such impropriety. So I translate as, he set up a victory festival, he set up a victory festival right in front of Mara's army and did not even consider it to be worth a blade of grass. May the conqueror give us victory. The clear implication here is that within Sangharakita's conception of propriety, the Buddha is the ideal and most proper subject of artistic expression. 
Yet propriety in courtly poetry also entails uh, adherence to courtly values. And his enlightenment is reconfigured as encapsulating the ideals of martial valor. As such, a singular, strong, heroic rasa emerges from the verse, accentuated by the Buddha's bravado in the face of his foe. By way of conclusion, we can say that Sangharakta did find a way to reconcile the roles and ideals of both poet and priest. In order to establish a theoretical mirror for uh, theoretical framework for Buddhist devotional poetry, he relied most importantly on Dundin's mirror and the commentary of his kinsman, Ratna Sri. Yet it was the Kashmiri tradition, represented not only by Anandavadana as previously thought, but also by Vamana and possibly Kshemendra, that allowed Sangharakita to theorize creatively about building a bridge between the aesthetic sentiment of court poetry and Buddhist devotion. He did not do this by advocating um, aesthetic emotion as a means to a salvific state in the form of some kind of bhakti rasa as happened elsewhere in South Asia. Instead, he focused on the idea of propriety as the governing principle of poetry and established his devotional writings as primarily an ethical practice. Thank you. Hello. Okay, Alistair. Um, thank you very much for a very lucid and uh, uh, interesting presentation. Um, my question kind of tries to look outside the text itself into yeah. the maybe literary culture sure. that develops on this junction between religious practices and traditions and yes. poetics. Um, can you find a kind of historical connections or developments around this time or following uh, in composition, it's, it's just my ignorance about yeah, this course, particular tradition, course. about composition of uh, devotional literature that follows or capitulates or rests on on this text or something that happens around this time. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, and I'm kind of postulating something that mm. might not be, but perhaps these uh, examples, right, that, that uh, try to demonstrate a new poetic possibility yeah. and new ways of expression that were followed or, or not. Mm, Maybe mm. so. That's my question. Okay, yeah. So we, you know, we don't have as much Kavya say as we do in Sanskrit, but we certainly, after the Subodha Lankara, I mean, this is maybe where Dragomir and I disagree. We can talk about the Jinnah Charita and its date. Um, but we do have Pali Kavya written after the Subodha Lankara, um, which clearly is influenced by the Subodha Lankara. Um, it's difficult because also we have the 1500s as the beginning of the Portuguese uh, invasion, so we kind of have a ground zero after about 100 years or so, so a lot is wiped out. Uh, but from the text we know we have you know, five or six um, kind of devotional kavyas. Um, in terms of its relationship to Singhala tradition and how the Singhala devotional literature develops, I mean, that's a, probably a question that Charlie can answer much more. Um, authoritatively than I can. Um, that's something I'm interested in, though, is you know, the, clearly the relationship between how did this feed into maybe vernacular practice, um, what, who, what was the audience of Pali, <laughs> Pali poetry, and you know, if it is associated with the court, what kind of, what, um, you know, what, what was actually the, the, the social context. Um, what was the second half of your question? I'm sorry, I, yeah. was that it? Yeah. Yeah. One one aspect here is the something that's kind of an overarching uh, feature of this workshop, I think, is the relationship between, and we didn't discuss this much, the relationship between poetics or poet poetic treatises and, and poetical practices or right. production of literature right. Uh, right. in actuality. Right. So just, it just looks like an interesting test case. Sure. I mean, you know, the Subodha Lankara has a kind of different life again when it moves into Southeast Asia, as we will, as we will hear. I mean, I know some of the verses are, you know, uh, it's been, we <coughs> have been used in meditational practices and things like that. And I know, you know, certain Pali Kavyas have become now paritas, um, so kind of ritual texts. Um, and so the life of what happens to the, you know, the, the, the purpose for which they are actually composed in the court in the 13th century may not be their purpose hundreds of years later. So the Pajamadu, for instance, I'm pretty convinced is, uh, well, it, 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 it's, you find it in manuscript form in um, uh, Parita manuals. So it is used today to dispel illness and things like that, whereas probably originally it was composed for 
amusement in the court, but the important thing is that they still thought it was worth preserving, but they just found a new use for it, I guess. Um, yeah. So this is just a question for further information since I know nothing about this, and especially since you, you mentioned that uh, um, he, he, this author comes from a royal family, et cetera, mm. and we've been talking about the court and the monastery. Mm. What do these actual spaces look like? I mean, what is, where would these, I mean, would the court and the monastery be in separate places or would they be together? How, how can we conceptualize this is one question. Mm. And then kind of a larger question um, about this idea of auchitya yeah. as being important. In what way can we talk about... Um, the way in which concepts move to be, do you see this as a move to make Auchitya central or is this just something you picked up and said, yeah, here, here's where we can see a moral imagination or is this, or do you think there's a conscious move to make this um, central? Uh. Okay, great. Um, so with the court and monastery, you know, when you're, you're dealing with someone like Sangharakata who's the Mahasami, the Grand Master, um, not at this time, because he's writing in the Dambadenia period, but um, the, well, uh, even in actually, even, in, even then, the, 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 the royal monastery, essentially, right, the central kind of Vatican type thing is, is adjacent, you know, is right next. If you look, go to the, something like Polonaruba, you know, the, 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 mo the royal monastery is right next to the court. Um, and so they're, they're spatially adjacent. You do get some movements, you know, as, as history, you know, people try and escape, uh, certain conflicts and things like that. So obviously the centers are always fluctuating, but when there is possibility, they tend to come come back together. Um, so that that's yeah. Um, and you know the the I could the, the way the monasteries are described, right? In terms of when you're reading, it's it's, it's Kavya-esque in the sense that you know they're described as these palatial places, right? Um, with you know running rivers, music, and all the rest of it. it it's equivalent to a palace. I mean. There's no real difference between aesthetically, you would say, and the kind of the um, other than the rules, perhaps that they follow, uh, in the, the, all the amenities uh, are there. Um, I think, I mean, when we're looking at the Subodh Lankara, I think that this is a conscious, a conscious um, decision to place Architya center stage because he mentions. I mean, I only mentioned two places where he mentions it. He mentions it in other areas as well. In the, in the beginning of his um, of the text, he analyzes his own insipid inter and, and, and stresses the Auchitya of it as well. Um, so this is something that he's clearly coming back to throughout the throughout the work. Um, and it seems, you know, and, and it seems to me that the the ethical side, um, um, the social aesthetic, is something which the monks take very seriously, um, because um, I if we look at the Sadhaniti as uh, as this kind of <coughs> Sanskrit literary theory travels, we find written in Pali documentation a palpable anxiety about the status of Buddhist literature when faced with the framework and, the, and, and principally the, the ethical discourse that we're going to be animals, you know, that, that if, if people think we're animals, if, if, if we do not somehow justify our old literature and then produce literature which does conform to a Sanskritic um, framework. Um, but other, not just fear, though. Obviously, you know what he's wanting to do. I think is is is, is um, devotion in this framework. You know, he he is cultivating himself as a monk, too, right? And 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 and, and, and it, in that sense, it's not maybe salvific, but it's still worthwhile to write poems. Even the seeming, you know, we can laugh and say they're seemingly erotic. You know, we all chuckle because we're kind of in, we're used to a, more, a, a different demarcation between eroticism and and just aesthetic beauty. But I don't think, you know, he wouldn't have probably found it too troubling, actually, um, and seen it as, as part of his, you know, he wouldn't see, he think of himself as breaking the Vinaya or something like that to talk about the Buddha's Sneha Rasa or something. About this Auchitya, but I thought, uh, considering literature at that time, is that what 
was introduced by Siyabas uh, Lakkara mm. and the translation of Siyabas uh, uh, Kavya Darsha actually led to this uh, what is called the Mahakavya literature. Uh, by this time, when Sangharakita was write, writing his thesis on uh, the Subodha, Subodha Lankara, uh, we have had several Mahakavyas, uh, one, mm. at least one or two Khandakavyas mm, mm, written. Mm. And we can see that in them, <coughs> there is great uh, exaggeration of things. And Atishyukti was given great uh, prominence <coughs> in these Kavyas. Mm. And my own feeling about the Subodha Lankara is that this interest in this Aujitya comes mm. as a reaction against the, uh, the way how Mahakavi tradition was handled by our writers. Mm. Mm. That, that mm. Uh, I, I read this about 105, uh, chap, uh, mm. Mm. verse 105, mm. uh, that Aujitya, there is a long description. And yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know whether you could accept this idea. You know, I, if you say it, Mika Skumbra, I, I accept <laughs> it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've, I can't critique, yes. I <laughs> Thank you, that was so interesting. And um, I particularly wanted to kind of bring you back to, oh, I, closer? Okay. <laughs> Um, to bring you back to the dosha section, because mm. I think when we think about um, the intersection of religion and literary theory, mm. I think the dosha sections tend to kind of provoke this moment of discomfort. Mm. And the example that you gave with the kind of confusion of the Buddha and a cow yeah. actually seems like quite a banal example. Right, 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 um, yeah. And I'm wondering if you can talk more about um, the parameters of talking about literary faults in relation to the Buddha. Right. No, that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah, some, some, there, there are some other, I could have maybe chosen some, some more humorous verses. There are some better ones, which I, I can show you later. But certainly this is interesting, especially in terms of, um, if I get this right, the, in, in the, the Subodha Lankara we have the, the Varodhi, so Agama, um, Loka, what's the, the Loka Varodhi as a, as a fault? Is that, if I... So what are the, what, what are the um, divisions of, of that? So we have uh, Nyaya, Agama, Desha, Kala. Okay, so when, when, we have this, when we have this fault discussed, what is interesting is that Sangharakita essentially um, provide, he doesn't actually, he doesn't provide examples of, of the fault itself, but he provides the example of the removal of the fault. And each one is just showing uh, how the Buddha transcend, is, transcends the world. And therefore, any f any f any fault of, of of obstructing worldliness is 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 is, is um, not possible when praising the Buddha, and so you have this strange tension between worldliness on the one hand and then the other worldliness um, of the subject. Um, but clearly, at that point, you know, he's trying to say that uh, the doses, in a sense, you know, maybe I, the way I read it is the way he's saying that is essentially um, these Sanskrit doses are, are less of a problem for us because we are tra we're describing the Buddha, um, and he, you know, is somehow, as an object of poetry, being the most proper object of poetry, you run less risk, you have less risk of falling into traps such as Kala Varodi, because, you know, whatever the Buddha wants to do in time, he can, and uh, things like that. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, no, no, I mean, I guess, uh, to kind of be more specific, do you get ascriptions of very negative qualities to the Buddha? Um, if the requirement is that yeah. each verse is actually right. a Buddha. No, 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 okay. no. All, all it is is just, you know, the, 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 you would never get descriptions of the negative quality of the Buddha. It's just purely that you'd have poetic lapses right. which, which could have an incidental meaning which would be negative. But he would never, he, he doesn't kind of say this is the, uh, you know, he never kind of use it as, a, as an opportunity to kind of let out his, let off, let off some steam. Uh, <laughs> Um, I wanted to come back to this question of Aushitya. This was uh, amazing and fascinating. Um, and I wanted to hear a little bit more, uh, some more thoughts about what are the literary values um, <coughs> that are actually represented by this text or implied by this text. 
Because um, several times you kind of made a jump. It's obvious that Sangharakita is involved in this project of bringing Sanskrit knowledge into Pali. Mm. Um, and so there's a certain concept of literary skill mm. that means familiarity with the Shastras. Yeah. But you glossed literary skill as writing good poetry. Um, and there's this joke from The Simpsons about a, a country a music group that just replaces the word baby with Jesus and becomes right. a Christian music band. <laughs> okay. And a lot of the verses in the Subodh Alankara do precisely that. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I'm, this is not exactly an evaluative question about whether this is good poetry or not, but um, I think that this I the, your idea of uh, interpreting Aochitya in a quite a different sense than Chimendra and other people as <coughs> not exactly propriety, but something more like what we would call piety, where every, every poetic utterance must contain something that either mentions the name of the Buddha mm. uh, or accords with some kind of mm. acceptance of Buddhist ethics. And that that is... Um, uh, that's kind of one of the qualifications for approaching literature, but uh, it's still not clear to me how that translates into a movement of devotional poetry, which you referred to kind of at the beginning of your talk and which so you asked about. So, so why the, the framing of Vauchitya leads to a movement of devotional poetry? Right. Like the, um, yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, the interesting thing, well, one, just, to, just before I answer, the interesting one verse in the Subodha Lankara says that even if you don't write poetry, even if you just know the Shastras, you'll become, you know, you'll gain fame and that, that, that's good enough. So, I mean, so it's not quite right that it's to say that you have to write poetry to develop, be an ethical individual. You at least need to know, to know the rules. Um, So, I mean, I think that he sees essentially, I mean, I, I, th I think while it is a different conception of Aochitya, certainly, I think it's on a continuum. You know, it's part of that, it's part of the same continuum that, you know, whatever receives the appropriation of the wise is, and, and, and essentially those who are wise are determined by certain social boundaries. And so that, um, so we can <coughs> say that the fact that um, what, so the, what is considered proper is not necessarily always internally proper. It's, it's always there's an audience there who, who is, is the determining what is what is proper? So I'm, I guess in a similar way that if you a minor minor poetic fault could be considered, you know, um, improper, but at the same time as you know disparaging the Buddha could be considered improper. But they're on a kind of a continuum in terms of what what it, what, what receives the praise of, of those who are who are skilled. Can you just repeat again the last part of your question? Just, uh, um, it, it it was kind of a the same as Gill's question. Yeah. You know, how how do you translate this? into an actual poetic movement that has its own values. Right, right, right. I mean, I guess we all, you know, in a sense, well, I need to, I would have to look at the, how, how this, how this trans, transfers necessarily. I mean, we don't, we have texts say something like this, you know, in Sadaniti or something where people are consciously saying, I don't want to be a beast, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to, I'm writing this because I, I don't want to be an animal. Um, and so we can see there's, there's, there's a trans, transmission there but also at the same time you know in at that's at this period um, there is an or there there are people who do not want the Buddhists in Sri Lanka to be writing poetry so we find in the Katikavatas um, references to the fact that writing poetry is bad that's problematic in and of itself because Sangharakita oversaw the composition of those Katikavatas <laughs> um, the, the word is shloka um, whether that refers to kavya I'm not too sure um, so there is an there is an opposition there. There is an opposition there, um, and so this isn't something which a Buddhist monk could just pick up and start doing without having to justify justify himself. Um, and so I, you know, I mean, this is where I come in, and I fully admit it that I'm reading this and saying this is what I think that Sangharakita is doing in front of this rather negative audience. You know, at the beginning of his work, he says he mentions that there are people who don't want me to write this, but I'm going to write it, and. Uh, this is, yeah, I mean, I think the centrality of it, the centrality of Aochitya in his work, um, I think this is how he sees the get-out clause 
right, in terms of avoiding the accusation that he's engaging in these, you know, um, senseless babble, right, that he can say, well, this is ethical. You know, this, is, this makes you, uh, this makes you a, a, a decent person. Because um, it's an index, ultimately it's an index of your, of your, of your moral and social character um, at this point, you know, the way that they describe, you know, Sariput, even though he never wrote Kavya, is described as the, the essential Kavi among poets, right? And because it's part of his self-presentation and self-cultivation, um, because that is what it requires you to be um, a good person, just as much as you brush your teeth in the morning or anything else. You know, this is all part of the rules and regulations and part of the socio-moral fabric. That's, that's the way I see it. I mean, it may be me. I understand that you may think that, you know, I'm kind of taking a leap, but that's what I do with historical information. Um, <laughs> well, it's not really a question, it's rather an echo to what you say. I'm relieved. Uh, yesterday when, uh, when David was asking what was the topic which uh, I'd been thinking about for the prehistory of this literature, mm. there was one topic which I did not mention and which comes under various words. And uh, so when I was trying to understand what samadhi is, I was reminded of things in Tamil literature. Mm. So we have things like ilakar, adakal, mm. uh, euphemistic expression, also called aveyal kilavi in the Tolkapiam, avey is saba. Mm. So the word you should not use in the saba. And you also have expression like mangalam. And uh, all these things, are treated in various parts, but they come together in one place in the Kilavi Akam, which is the first uh, chapter uh, in the Tsoladigaram. Mm. And uh, so that sutra in the Kilavi Akam reads Tagudium Varakum Tarina Vurugum Pagudi Kilavi Varei Nilei Ilave. So Varei Nilei Ilave it means they are not forbidden, they are not excluded. Mm. Pagudi Kilavi these words which are called Palgudi mm. Kilavi. And uh, they are of two ways. They, they embrace Tagudium, either, so that which is fitting. Tagudi is that which is appropriate. Mm. And Varakum means the educated word usage. Mm. So these words which uh, <coughs> follow uh, what is appropriate and what is according to word usage, and which are called Pagudi Kilavi, mm. are not forbidden. So it means that society is more important than grammar. Mm. Uh, and since this is a grammar of poetry, mm. it seems to resemble very much what you describe. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you... Yeah, that's an, exciting, that's an exciting parallel. Mm. Absolutely, I'd have to, have to look at it. I just do want <coughs> to... Uh, Say something about Andrews, uh, what he asked, you know. Because this was a time when <coughs> single literature was developing as a devotional literature. Like you have the Butsarna, Amavatra, Pujavali, and all those texts are devotional texts. So in devotional texts, you, don't, <coughs> you cannot go actually too deep into the aesthetic issues. It is devotional. And as he said, you know, this is a devotional kind of poem. And some consider Subodha Lankara as a kind of a devotional thing. So I think uh, uh, whether it can cater to this higher uh, aesthetic uh, things is quite questionable. You know. Pardon? Did you want to comment on that? No, I, the fact that I agree. I agree. The question I have. In some ways, it's all hovering around the same issue. The way I would put it is how we go, the general problematic is how we go from reading a literary text to some representation of what, what is happening in the past. Mm. And the language that Andrew gave to us yesterday of final vocabulary, uh, where he added to it that, oh, in the final vocabulary, if you change it, the mm. form of life associated with it changes. Mm. So the one very beautiful verse, where it's comparing devotees to peacocks yeah. and the coming of uh -huh. the rains, the phrase, muni mego um, ummado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So mm. it would seem that ummado can't be in the final vocabulary mm. of Buddhism at mm. this time. Right. So then the question is, is there a different kind of devotional movement mm. that is being introduced, that right. is, this is representing, yeah. or we should read this as some form of atishayoti mm. that is showing the <coughs> truth mm. by this exaggeration, but there's no representation in it that's reliable. Right. And so then one of but the other thing is that it seems that the text itself wants to draw attention to its problematic nature mm. by using mm. words like umad. Sure. Uh, sure. Th th so that and it, issue, it, it, that mm. you say, if you want to defend yourself against critics, yeah. you don't give them ammunition. Right, right. Yeah. But the text seems <laughs> to be giving critics ammunition all the time. Sure. No, I, I agree, I agree. And he plays, he, plays, he plays with this all the time. You know, he's talking about... Um, the rasaric, you know, the the, the 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 raga experienced by people, and the, the viraga of the Buddha, and he's using this. He's using the. He's playing. You know, you can see he's playing with the social um, divide. You could say in his poetry all, all the time. You know that he's, he's he's he uses it to his advantage to beautify to beautify his works. And, uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, in a sense, I, I I perhaps disagree. I think with with uh, um, the idea that I think his poetry is pretty good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just had a um, another uh, just uh, a text came to mind when you were mentioning um, this question of devotion in, in, the, in the Alankara Shastra. Uh, I think you were using as a foil the uh, the Goswami, you know, the whole Bhakti Rasa yeah. thing, in, in which I may have got completely. Wrong. That's fine. Yeah. But there's yeah. another work, of course, that's uh, closer to time that would okay. be much more interesting to look at. This is uh, the uh, Sarada mm. of Baladeva Vidya Bhushana, which in some ways. Even though Mammata is the pr perhaps primary intertext, I'm not sure, but that, you know, there's and it's really interesting the ways in which the examples are. It's much easier, of course, with the Vaishnavas mm -hmm. to make the examples much closer to some of the erotic love poetry. Um, but it's in, I think a similar process of attempting to assimilate the Alankara Shastra into a a kind of a learned culture, but also a kind of religious culture in a very interesting way, uh, and especially the ways in which some of the Alankaras have to be adjusted this is from my recollection of reading that with, uh, with somebody so but but it's Fantastic. An interesting work. Yeah. yeah i mean I, I really appreciate that because that's certainly going to be i need to certainly learn a lot more about other uh, parallel movements and you you know the, from the uh, poetics to devotion elsewhere in south asia in particular yeah okay um you know, one comment i want to make is uh <coughs> the uh sort of uh, correspondence with uh, other Buddhist traditions, uh, mm. say in, in Tibet, uh, uh, you know, there is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this reservation about uh, writing erotic poetry because most of these are monks, and, uh, and I can speak uh, on behalf of perhaps uh, Bema Bon. Uh, in conversation I learned, uh, for instance, the, the Buddhist, uh, simply the monks, I guess, they're replacing erotic poetry with uh, devotion to the teachers. But, but I think also that there are so like different kinds of uh, reservations. Uh, uh, one, there's another kind, which is, you know, why do we uh, uh, engage in this, uh, maybe something which we can call a verbal art? So then, uh, you know, there are some, I, you know, <coughs> certainly there, uh, in, 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 certain Buddhists have the, the, the sense that, that what we are interested in is in meaning mm. rather than word. So mm. the contrast between uh, word and meaning. Mm. So then, uh, you know, in order to do that, uh, to, uh, to, to solve this problem that, uh, in Tibet, that there are certain kinds of theoretical frameworks which are presented, say, uh, uh, poetry is a part of the, uh, the Vidya Sthana. Mm. Uh, so then there's a question of which uh, Sthana does it fit into. But then, uh, then uh, the idea is then uh, to be able to uh, to uh, to be a Buddha, then you have to be uh, omniscient and you have to know everything. Mm. So then, uh, there's a question of uh, what caveat uh, 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 fit into. Mm. So then, there is this kind of uh, uh, justification. So I'm thinking about uh, what kinds of uh, reservations there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you in, uh, encounter <coughs> in, in Pali and uh, Theravadan uh, poetry and right. what kinds of uh, justifications that they... Uh, that's they a great provided. question. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the, sim the equivalent um, <coughs> in the, the monks writing at this time, they justify um, this type of philological work under the framework of Nuruti Patisambhida, 
which is the discriminative awareness of, 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 of language, which is an old, an old um, factor of, the Buddha, of enlightenment, or one, one of the characteristics you must possess to become enlightened, actually. And so, nuruti, so nurukti pratisamvid, or nuruti pratisambida. Um, and there, I'm trying to think, there are, there is, it's not, there's, there's arta pratisam, there's, 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 they're all basically philological, these kind of discriminative awarenesses um, which the Buddha possessed. In the Theravada tradition, this only refers to being able to understand Pali when it is spoken. In the Mahayana tradition, when the Sangha is talking about Narukti Pratisamvid, what he talks about is being um, multilingual. So having an ability to preach to anybody in, any, in, their, in their mother tongue is the, is the characteristic of a Buddha. For the Theravada tradition, it is only to speak Pali. Um, and so we have an interesting divergence here. But in the, this continues into the medieval period. And at this point, they, they, they take all of this kind of kavya and la linguistic cultivation and they put it under the, 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 the value of Nuruti Parisambhida. And they say, you know, um, so they, they, they reframe it. They reframe it. Yeah. So in the interest of sticking to our strict time schedule, we'll um, thank Alistair. For well, thank you. Thank you.